25th, I think. Yeah, 2019. Uh, resuming the second half of chapter 17 and the beginning of chapter 18 of Human Action. Study guide by Robert Murphy. And I think where we left off was probably like right in the middle. We've talked about length substitutes, fiduciary media. I think that's where we left off was fiduciary media. So that was part 12 of chapter 17. <clears throat> so let's pick up there. Okay. So how is the confidence important with regard to fiduciary media? So, um, you, like, uh, you need to have confidence in, you know, the bank that's issuing you know, the bank notes. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting how um, he showed that the government kind of, like, so without, like, the government insurance on banks, then it was up to the consumer to know what the good banks are and trust that. But since, uh, since the government got involved, then it led to people, you know, just having faith in every single bank now, which led to, like, the expansion of credit and the money supply. Uh, right, yeah. So that's, like, a... Cause every bank is credit worthy if it's all backed somehow. Right, so they're all like FDIC insured and stuff. Right. So then everyone just has complete confidence in all notes, which leads to, you know, the expansion of them if people just have complete confidence. That makes sense. So it'll be interesting if we ever go away from that system, let's say a, a Bitcoin system. Salt lending. They're not right. FDIC insured. Mm -hmm. So it's up to, so there'll be a lot of failures, there'll be a lot of people that lose money because they're going with bad banks. Yeah, well hopefully they are smart enough to collateralize any um, mm -hmm. credit that they extend. Mm -hmm. Right. And then with the changing prices of Bitcoin, sometimes they say, hey, you got to cough up more Yeah. Uh, in order to cover this loan or... Mm -hmm. But it's a huge cultural shift, like, think about the people that are in their 40s and 50s, and all their life, they've been taught this way, they, like, that's how they've been living. That there's endless credit? There's endless credit, and everything, like, you don't have to, like, do your dil due diligence on a bank or anything like that. So, like, we have this whole generation of people, well, multiple generations of people that don't really understand how, like, capitalist like banking system would work mm -hmm. well it's exciting mm -hmm. I think uh, capitalist banking is still relatively new in the span of human history and so we've only been without it for just a blink of an eye mm -hmm. um, but that's everyone's lifetime yeah right <laughs> that, that'll, that'll be it'll be good to, to go uh, experience it again what is the main argument for each independent bank to issue its own notes? So I, I think I kind of jumped the gun on that. So, that, so it's just getting to that point. Like, you know, the best banks are going to produce the best notes. People are going to go to the best banks. I think that's what I'd say. Not only that, I think that it's better for the whole system because it helps consumers identify good from bad, mm -hmm. uh, rather than socializing the uh, negative consequences of um, a bad bank existing among good ones. And um, no good bank will do business or have a, a business relationship with uh, another bank that's not of high quality, mm -hmm. if they're all independent. Right. We would refuse to do business with a like uh, XYZ bank that has a really bad history. Mm -hmm. What were the consequences of the laws that compelled banks to keep a reserve in a definite ratio of the total amounts of deposits and of banknotes issued? Uh, as you put earlier, it expanded credit. Mm -hmm. Possibly and likely beyond the 
natural rate. Right. What is necessary to prevent any further credit expansion, according to Mises? Hmm. I'd think. So, you'd, the Federal Reserve would have to stop setting interest rates, I think. The, they'd have to let the market settle on an interest rate. Mm -hmm. So, they're really low right now. But perhaps, you know, the, if it was up to the market, the rate would be really high and mm. there'd be a lot less credit out there. So I, I, that's my guess. I don't really remember mm. the solution. Fair enough. I think it makes sense, you know. You, so if you want zero credit, you make the interest rates incredibly high. You know, if I give you a loan at 100% interest, like, you're probably not going to take that loan so that credit's never created. Right. Yeah, good point. Why do governments profit from using the printing press? I think most simply put, they are the first to use the new money. And so mm -hmm. while um, new money put in circulation over time uh, dilutes the value of all the money and has negative consequences, the person who is first to use it um, has extra benefit because the, the market has not yet perceived the increase. Right. Well, isn't it the Federal Reserve that is actually the first to use it. They purchase bond, government bonds for cash, right? That's my understanding. I think you're right. So, I mean, the government is one of the first to be able to use it. Right. So, but the uh, first are, is the Fed who buys government bonds for the printing press. Uh huh. And, the, and then they talked about how, um, like, central banks have become pretty much arms of the treasury. Mm -hmm. uh. So when the consequence of the Federal Reserve being the first to use the money is that they buy treasury bonds, mm -hmm. which in essence is credit to the U.S. government, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's a promise that the government will pay them back this much money plus interest, but the interest hasn't been created yet because the Federal Reserve makes the money. So it's, never, it's like, here's a hundred dollars and here's a bank note that says I'll pay a hundred and ten dollars in ten years. But that there, that ten dollars hasn't been created yet. So, Presumably it will be. Right, but it'll be created by the Fed with more interest. Like the debt can, like, the bonds can never be paid off because there's always interest mm. for these bonds. Like, the debt can never be cancelled out. Playing devil's advocate here, I know I don't have a full understanding of the situation. What um, would prevent the new capital from being, cre like, the new wealth? Wealth can be created, right? So, But dollars can't. So mm. The loan is That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The dollars see. come from one place, the central bank. Right. So let's pretend there's zero dollars in the economy, and they issue the first bond for a hundred dollars. So there's the first bond, and then that bond says, ten years from now we'll pay you back a hundred ten dollars. There's only a hundred dollars in the economy, so the only way to pay back that is to print more money or to have this credit expansion. Oh no, That's a, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so dumb. Hmm. A good video on this is, have you ever seen Mike Maloney's Hidden Secrets of Money? I don't know if I've seen that video in particular, but I've seen Mike Maloney. Yeah, he has like a, a 10 part series, I think number four 
goes through the loop of how a dollar's like the life cycle of a dollar mm. and how it's created and it goes through like all those diff- different steps with good animations I would really like to rewatch that yeah I watch it like once every six months cool <laughs> Okay, so why shouldn't we fear a cartel of commercial banks? Uh, because they won't do business with sucky banks. Mm-hmm. It would ruin their reputation and they would all fall apart. Right. What is the relation between credit expansion and the rate of interest? So I think it's an inverse relationship. So, meaning if the rate of interest is high, the credit expansion is low, and when the rate of interest is low, the credit expansion is high. Perfect. Thirteen. The size and composition of cash holdings, in what way does the employment of money substitutes that are not used abroad fuel the emergence of a surplus. What does surplus mean in this context? So I think this, they're talking about the surplus of money, or the surplus of cash, I believe. In what way does the employment of money substitutes that are not used abroad fuel the emergence of a surplus. What does a surplus mean in this context? So I believe a money substitute is something like that, a traveler's check, correct? I think it's also something like um, checkbook money. Checkbook money. Where it's not money itself, it's mm-hmm. just numbers on a piece of paper, but it's just as good as money. Mm-hmm. And uh, people accept it as money without a at plus or minus to it, like this is exactly the right amount. Um, and those are not used abroad. For example, um, I don't use a, a check from my bank at, you know, when I go to Montreal. Mm-hmm. Well, it, that's a TD bank, but it's a bad example, but in China or something. Right. Um, How does it fuel the emergence of a surplus? Well, I would think if you don't use the money abroad, um, money should be able to travel like any other commodity. Uh, If there's a shortage of it somewhere, it should be Uh, able to flow. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but if you can't use that money abroad, um, presumably that leads to a surplus where it mm. is used. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so there's a def- there's a surplus of this money substitute. Yeah. Okay. In which cases does a surplus go abroad? Um, when the the inside money is used ab- abroad, for example, and I think we covered this a little bit last week now that I remember, well, I can go to Argentina and use American dollars. Mm-hmm. You can go to Cuba and use American dollars, and lots of places will accept American dollars, but I won't accept Argentinian dollars, uh, pesos. Right. And so, um, in the cases where the money is good, it can go abroad. And where it's um, bad, it, it can't. And what is Gresham's law? It's like the opposite. It's like bad money drives good money out. That was an interesting quote. Yeah, can you explain that? Kind of. I thought about it a lot. So the people are going to use the bad money first. And it's going to drop, so if your economy is using the bad money, good money is not getting in the economy. So then this bad money is just being continually circulated. It's like, let's say we have a circular economy. Like, I pay you for something, I'm going to give you my bad money. And you're going to use your bad money to go pay someone else. And so, like, 
it's driving out us from using good money. But for example, if I have BSV and Litecoin in my wallet and the juicery says that they'll take Litecoin, I'm giving them Litecoin <laughs> and I'm keeping the BSV. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, and that is bad because then they'll have stupid bad money. And what are they supposed to do with it? I guess they, they want it. Why would people accept bad money? Maybe it's mandated that they have to accept it? Yeah, I guess that's what it, I mean, no, I mean, it's not mandated, like... For dollars it is. And for silver and gold it used to be, right? No, it's for any, like, public debt. But that's not at, like, a store. Right. You don't have to accept dollars at your store. Well, there was a time when um, the value of gold and silver was set and it was set by the government at the low market rates mm -hmm. for silver and above market rates for gold and so silver all left it was one or the other yeah. like um, people were all using the silver because it was the like less good money. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Balance of payments. What is the definition of balance of payments? What information does a balance of payments convey? In what ways is the size of the group under consideration important? Back. I think this had to do with uh, international trade where it's like, yeah. the balance of payments is the record of the money equivalent of the incomings and outgoings of an individual or group during a specific period of time. The credit side and the debit side are necessarily equal. The balance of payments is always in balance. The modern view that a net outflow of money reflects a negative balance of trade is due to mercantilist prejudices. A trade deficit is not an unforeseen calamity that strikes a nation, but rather the cumulative outcome of deliberate transactions undertaken by each individual within the nation. No one worries that the residents of New York might foolishly spend all of their money on wares from other states. The situation is more complicated when other countries and foreign currencies are involved, but the principle is the same. So I think it's like China's beating us on trade, you know, like that whole thing is, uh, is ridiculous because just because I want to buy something from China, from a person in China, I'm one person, they're one person, we're trading, um, yeah, we're getting stuck. There's not a negative balance. The modern view that a net outflow of money reflects a negative balance of trade is due to mercantilist prejudices. It's the cumulative outcome of deliberate transactions undertaken. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, there's no deficit involved here. It's just trading. What information does a balance of payments convey? Um, who wants, who's trading with one another? How many uh, incomings and outgoings of money equivalents during a specific period of time? You know, what way is the size of the group under consideration important? Well, if you're talking about a person, or a state, or a country, you know, you can have all different sizes of measuring the balance of payment. You know, me and this one guy in China versus everyone in America and everyone in China. Yeah, and it's most of the time it doesn't really make sense. It's all individuals making individual trades. Yeah, I think you could take a reasonable snapshot at any point. Okay. Cruising right along. Interlocal exchange rates. Comment. As a rule, commodities move only in one direction. 
But money is shipped now this way, now that. Oh, that's, that's, why is that a question? Is there, I think that was a comment. Maybe they want us to talk about it? I think maybe it's just setting up for some of these questions. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. All right. Why does it make no difference whether the cities concerned belong to the same sovereign nation or to different sovereign nations? What is the role of shipping cost within the frame of these transactions? So, I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about. So as a rule, commodities move in only one direction, but money is shipped this way, now that. I don't know what that means. Yeah. I, I think that, so like, what could it mean? I mean, my first thought, but I don't think it's correct, is... I should ship now this way. Yeah, I don't really know because it, 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 a commodity can move in both directions, I feel like. I think maybe the point that but, he's getting at here is that commodities move from raw material to end product, and so they're always moving from producer to consumer in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But money is involved every step of the way. <clears throat> it goes up and down the ladder. Okay, that makes sense. So, I guess my main thing, I was thinking of gold as a commodity, where gold was money in this situation. Mm -hmm. Because, like, if gold is more valuable in the United States than Argentina, then it's going to come here. And then when it's more valuable in Argentina versus the United States, it's going to go back. Right. But that's that's money. That's not a commodity. Well, isn't money a commodity? Yeah, but it's like commodity money. Like. Ah, uh, it's so yeah. little different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does it make no difference whether the city's concerned belong to the same sovereign nation or to different sovereign nations? Oh, well, we, we just uh, covered that a little bit in talking in the mm -hmm. last section that uh, there's really no economic significance to it, it being New York or China. Yeah, it, the shipping cost matters though because it'd have to be worth your time to ship the gold to China. Or it'd have to be worth, like, I guess your time plus the cost of it shipping to go to China and sell it. How has the government interference sharpened the difference between domestic payment and payment abroad? So there's a lot of regulation and friction in the international banking system. I'd say that to... It's a lot harder for me to pay a businessman in China than it is someone here. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> because they said, okay, look, anytime you use a dollar, it's going to be good anywhere in the U.S., more people use those dollars, but then it also creates this border of the U.S., whereas if they didn't do that, then there would be independent banks, presumably some in China, some in the U.S., and you could trade those banknotes just as easily, and they would travel across different nations. Um, and then one step removed from that, if you use just like a commodity like gold or Bitcoin, those really can move. Uh, so government interference sharpens the difference between domestic payment and payment abroad in that way. What is the purchasing power parity theory? 
purchasing power parity. Why does the mutual exchange ratio between various kinds of money tend to a final state? Oh, okay, because it's like the arbitrage. So, the, the euro and the, the dollar is going to, they're not going to be, like the ratio between the euro and the dollar are going to be similar here versus in Europe. Right. And if they're not, then someone's going to take that opportunity to buy more euros and sell dollars. Yep. Who benefits from dealing with the differences in exchange ratios? Someone who plays that role of arbitrage. Interest rates and the money relation. What are the causes for differences in the interest rate? It's a short summary. Uh, oh, interest rates. I'll just read it all. Please. Credit transactions carried out in the same currency tend to yield the same interest rates for comparable credit risk. When money is borrowed in one currency and lent in another, the investor must take into account not only the difference, different interest rates involved, but also the possible change in exchange rates in the life of the loan. Well, to the, to the first question, I say the differences in interest rates are caused by people having different risks. You know, if someone comes to me and they're like, I'll put up this Lamborghini, I need to borrow 10 bucks, I'm like, yes, okay, that's fine, I'll take that risk. Yeah. And they're like, I've never made a dollar in my life and I want a million bucks. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. uh, your interest rate is going to be way higher. Um, <clears throat> Why is it impossible if A and B are both under the same standard for the banks of A to expand credit if those of B do not apply the same policies? I don't really know. I know. It's because, say, you're a bank A and I'm a bank B and bank A extends you credit and you write me a check, I'm going to go cash that check right away because I'm at bank B. Mm. I don't know that that's any good. And uh, then, okay. then A just wrote out credit for something it doesn't have. It needs B to play along. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Does some agency need to defend a nation's currency system? Um, is that my, like, opinion man? I don't think so. Well, I mean, I'd say the dollar needs an agency to defend its system because, like, for example, like what you just said, if nothing was enforcing all the different banks from having the same policy, it wouldn't work. So... Or they could just not expand credit. That would be fine, too. Right, but that wouldn't be the same currency system. Right. For, like, the current currency system, it, it needs an aid. Like, it's inefficient, but it needs an agency system. Mm-hmm. Because if not everyone plays, six of the protocol, it doesn't work. I guess you're right, yeah. It does need a, uh, an agency to defend the, the nation's currency system. Can the market rate of interest be permanently lowered by credit expansion? No. Why? Um, can the rate of 
So when you're lowering the rate of interest, more loans are going out than should based on the market. So there is a lot more malinvestment and that. So you have all this credit expansion, all these loans going out. Um, but the money isn't being properly allocated because of the expansion, which is going, which leads to the crack up boom that they talk about. And so eventually, there's going to be a, a crack, crack up or crack top boom, mm -hmm. where all this malinvestment isn't going to lead to the returns for the loans. And so there's, there's going to need to print. More. You can't keep lowering interest rates. Forever. Why? Because people can't pay back those loans, they get too high, or that. The so I guess loans become so you can't go to negative interest rates. So there's a there's a bottom. So I guess not with do like negative interest rates wouldn't work with dollars. I guess everyone would have to move to this bank bank money for negative interest rates. But so there's clear bottom, like if you cut interest rates to zero and there's all this malinvestment and then so you can't keep lowering them like you, there's there's a floor. That makes sense. So like to pay for the bad investments of yesteryears, we cut interest rates. So we have more cheap money to pay back the loans. Right. So, but tomorrow, like, if we cut them to zero, tomorrow, we can't we can't lower them to pay back the now investments. We have to raise those interest rates at some point in order to get the interest to pay off the loans. Is that what you're saying? We can't. Money, like, once interest rates are at zero. Yeah. Money's the cheapest it'll ever be. Like, it could be negative. It could, I guess. Could be. I guess you go with negative. I think they have in some countries. Not negative interest rate, really. Negative interest rates. Yeah, it means that. It means it costs people... money to keep money out of bank. Yes. Yeah, I guess you could do that, but then so <laughs> even then you you can't go to you can't go past negative one hundred. <laughs> you can't go past negative 100. That's a good point. So there is a floor. Okay. Can the market rate of interest be permanently lowered by credit expansion? I, I don't exactly know. I still don't think I've gotten to the exact answer to this question, but I feel like the answer is no. It just doesn't seem right. You have the market rate of interest will come back up. Yeah, because then you would have infinite credit expansion, and that would lead to... It can't last. Yeah. What is the only means of keeping a local and national currency permanently at par with gold and foreign exchange? Say, so yeah, like, 100% reserves. That would make sense. In that case, um, there would be no reason to prefer local or national currency or gold or foreign money. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. One isn't um, artificially cheaper. Right. Secondary media of exchange. What are secondary media of exchange? I think it's a short one. Those items that are still quite marketable, though not as much as the money good, will enjoy a demand for both their original use but also because of their marketability. In this respect, they can be considered a secondary media of exchange. A good example of that are pogs. You know, those pogs, those circle little. I do know what, I know what pogs are. Yeah. Those are secondary. I mean, like people trade them. 
not as good as money, but people will accept them, maybe. I feel like that's what it is. Yeah. Like a tradable good. So... So that the fact that one or more media of exchange have risen to the status of money does not eliminate the differences in marketing, marketability among remaining goods. So even though, like, okay, gold became money, mm -hmm. but pogs are still also they're a secondary <laughs> media of exchange. They're not as they're not the money, mm -hmm. but they're also good. Typical examples include government and high-grade corporate bonds. So it's like. Yeah, okay, this isn't a dollar, or this isn't a $50 bill, but it's a $50 bond. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. It's pro It's almost as good. What else have we got? What are the most popular secondary media of exchange? Just answered. What is meant by hot money? What is its significance? Gosh, I don't know. Yeah, it seems. See if I can find it. Hot money. The governments of almost all countries are engaged in a campaign against the capitalists. They are intent upon expropriating them by means of taxation and monetary measures. The capitalists are eager to protect their property by keeping a part of their funds liquid in order to evade confiscatory measures in time. They keep balances with the banks of those countries in which the danger of confiscation or currency devaluation is for the moment less than in other countries. As soon as the prospects change, they transfer their balances into countries which temporarily seem to offer more security. It is these funds which people have in mind when speaking of hot money. Okay. The significance of hot money for the constellation of monetary something affairs is the outcome of the one reserve system. So, hot money is liquid money that people keep on hand to move around so that it's not confiscated. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I got. I can't think of a example that I'm familiar with. Yeah, exactly. Gold. No, yeah. you, people will keep a little bit of gold because um, it's harder to confiscate than bank money. Mm -hmm. 18. The inflationist view of history. What's wrong with the view that economic progress is only possible in a world of rising prices? Because it's in, it's insane. Like prices should te as technology gets better, and we have capital goods from um, the past that are still around. The price of things should fall. Yeah. Yeah. And it's insane. Like I think I read nobody really understands that. I think. Wouldn't it be just great? I mean, it should be the natural state of things that as we get more efficient and our money is sound, then it becomes easier right. to make things. It should get so much cheaper. Yeah. But no, the, the candy bar gets more expensive as the years go by. Right. If people, it, I think the majority of people say, that's right, it should go that's up. That's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is if you have a really bad money. It's insane, it's such a bad system. Yeah. Well, for some. Right. For, for, for the majority. Yeah. 
why will opportunities for earning profit for an entrepreneur appear in a world of falling prices as well as one in of rising prices? Because the entrepreneur is saving money and is going to invest that money in good opportunities. Mm. And it doesn't. In a situation of rising prices, it may lead even a smart entrepreneur to make bad investments because they just got to get rid of their money. Oh, yeah. So if you give the entrepreneur more time to sit back and, okay, my money's not losing any value, maybe it's not gaining any value, or maybe it is gaining value, then the entrepreneur can make smart investments. He can wait for the right opportunity, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You can give him patience. Yeah. And there are still a, uh, efficiencies to be made, and there's new technologies that are created that make things more productive. Yeah, so. it, it's silly to think that with the def deflationary currency that people just end up hoarding money. It's like, no, money doesn't, you can't eat money. You can't, right. you can't go on vacations with your money. Like, you need to spend it. Yeah, plus people want to do things like have space discos. Yeah. The gold standard. Why is it nonsense to qualify the gold standard as a barbarous relic? this section. He said, um, to call anything a barbarous relic just because it happened that way in history is ridiculous. You could call English speaking a barbarous relic just because people spoke English before mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's a barbarous relic um, just because it's a historical example. It wouldn't necessarily have to be gold. It just was gold be because it had the, the right properties in the time and place for yeah. what people needed. But catalactics would say that anything that served those those needs of uh, divisibility and transferability and you know reliability that has good qualities would work just as well. Why did bimetallism, as established by the government, fail? Because they set the wrong exchange rates. Mm -hmm. Why did governments fight the gold standard? Because it didn't allow them to inflate the money supply. Right. In what way does the gold standard limit the field of intervention of governments? Because they can't, they don't control the supply of gold, so they can't print money. Mm hmm. What are the functions of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF? Is it necessary for the continuation of monetary affairs? I must have completely missed this in the chapter. He does talk about the IMF, which surprised me quite a lot. Um, I thought it was a relatively new phenomenon, and this book being published in 1949. Um, seems like uh, sort of a newer reference, but maybe it's, it's not. I don't know too much about the history of the IMF, but here's, here's the little section on it. Um, no cooperation is necessary to make an international gold standard work. Each government redeems its notes in exchange for the stipulated weight of gold. The various schemes for monetary cooperation are attempts to evade the limits to fiduciary media that a unilateral central bank would experience. If all governments expand in concert, then there will be no drain on their monetary reserves. This approach still overlooks the problem of the trade cycle dealt with in Chapter 20. Anything else about the IMF here? No. Um, so what can we say in answer to that question? Um, I think that answered it. Well, it didn't say what are the functions of the IMF. 
I really don't know. <clears throat> Here's something on the IMF. It would be irrelevant to object that this problem did not play an important role in the negotiations which preceded the establishment of the International Monetary Fund, and that it was easy to reach an agreement concerning the use of the fund's resources. The Bretton Woods Conference was held under very particular circumstances. Most of the participating nations were at the time entirely dependent on the benevolence of the United States. They would have been doomed if the United States had stopped fighting for their freedom and aided them materially by lend, by lend lease. So the IMF functions as the central bank of the world, mm -hmm. making sure that all banks inflate at the same time. Is that the idea? Yeah, I think so. Well, I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs>